everyone. This is Chris, and you're listening to the Live Fix Podcast, the podcast that explores the concert fan experience. We believe live music is life-altering. Join us as we share stories and connect with concert fans to discover how live music forever rocks our world before, during, and after the show. Greetings, live music fans. Have you ever wondered what it would be like if you went back and documented and reflected on the impact and meaning of every concert experience you've ever had? What would you learn about yourself? What would you discover about your love for live music? But what if you didn't do it? Would you forget some of your favorite concerts and what they meant to you? Would you not be able to get the real perspective of what your favorite shows meant to you in the full context of your life? These are just some of the things that we're gonna dive into in this episode of Live Fix Podcast. That's right. On this episode, we talked to various artists. He's the host and creator of MyLifeInConcert.com podcast. For the last few years, he's been documenting and revisiting every live show he's ever seen from 1975 to the present. His podcast is about the concert-going experience. Rather than simply being a description of the performance, it's a mixture of concert review, music history, memoir and philosophical music. It's really great stuff. And it's right up our alley here on Live Fix. On this episode, we're going to explore the swell of anticipation that he felt leading up to seeing David Bowie live. We're going to look at what he remembers most about his first concert seeing Roxy Music in 1975. We're going to uncover why our sense of smell helps us recall our favorite concerts and concert venues. And what about the role of a concert fan tribe? We're going to look at why concerts are one of the most unique global communities we will ever be a part of, and why reflecting on that present moment of our favorite shows and the live music experience is such a cathartic force in our lives. And we're going to take a look at the power of journaling our concert experiences and how doing that puts this beautiful, broader perspective and context on our live music experiences and it and it also reveals what that life-changing experience that we feel during a show really means to us in the longer view of our lives this is a good one and we hope you enjoy the show all right various artists thank you so much for for joining us we've uh we've Hello, really it's enjoyed nice uh, to meet you Yes. And uh, hi, Chris. And uh, hi, Chris and Colleen. It's great to finally talk to you. I've heard your podcast and really enjoy it. So it's great to finally get uh, to be able to talk with both of you. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're excited to d- jump into a lot of a lot of cool questions. You know, I, I think uh, it was end of summer, late, early fall. I came across your your podcast and your project and you know, um, your, your experiment journey adventure. Um, he keeps talking about it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Hey, that's yeah. what I want to hear. And every <laughs> time we go on a road trip, it's like, let's put, let's listen to another one. Let's listen. And it ends up being listening to, you know, two or three of them. So we've, we've definitely had you in our, on our speakers, in our speakers. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. well, nice to be here. And of course that's music to my ears to hear. So that's wonderful. Yeah. Cause I, uh, I came across this and I said, I said, Colin, look, look at what this, this guy is doing. He's journaling and cataloging his entire concert experience and and that's you know uh, uh, you know really what we're we're doing here with live fix is is celebrating that you know the moments before during and after and a lot of your mission you know of the uh my life in concert is to capture not just the the music experience that's happening on stage but you're 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 diving into the the meaning and the significance of that uh you know throughout the whole the whole experience so we're we're really excited and yeah i've been you know, Colleen's like, finally, we get to talk to him, you know, mm-hmm. all that, well, all that stuff. So, yeah. What you were just saying there about the before, during and after that really resonated with me when I listened to some of your podcasts, when you said that, and I said, thought exactly, because it's more than just the music that you hear while you're there, because it's, it, that's kind of like the centerpiece. It's like having the centerpiece of a meal, but there's all these other courses and things and social aspects that happen it's the magnet the center but it's more than that and the dessert is how you get home right after the show sometimes it's the dessert (laughs) it depends (laughs) 
Yeah. Sometimes no, the, the uh, bakery is closed. Yeah. Or if the bakery is uh, thousands of people trying to get out of one lane in a parking spot, you know, in a parking lot for five hours, um, just depends, especially <laughs> at some festivals and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. It can be kind of a conga line uh, sometimes, you know, getting uh, getting out for sure. But what, what you're doing with um, My Life in Concert, again, is is really remarkable. And we wanted to have you on to talk about kind of how it got started. Uh, I know we've listened to uh, your very first episode and you uh, you definitely take us t- take, you know, your your audience into like what what inspired you. And we'd love to have you talk a little bit about about that, because um, you you're you're very descriptive in, you know, your musical first musical experiences, you know, as a I think it was an eight or nine year old, 10 year old. Uh, when you were first uh, discovering music, your influence of your, uh, I believe it was your your brother uh, that um, introduced you to music and kind of built this uh, this anticipation of going to a show. So here here we are in you know 2023, and I believe in 20 uh, 2022 uh, or, or no 20 2021, you began to uh, catalog all these uh, these shows. So what? What what made you want to do that? Or what was your 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 moment there? Take us take us to there. Well, first I want to back up a bit because you were saying that I started to have this interest in music when I was about about eight years old. No, it's before that. I literally came out of the womb a music fan. Mm-hmm. And you talk to any of my parents' friends or older relatives who are sadly all passing, they will tell you. And that's kind of what's a bit different for me and other people I've met in that for a lot of people, their interest in music kind of is an early teenage thing. And literally, it's it's my earliest memories. I've got a picture up on the website of me when I'm about one, trying to get into my aunt's stereo to put on the Hard Day's Night single. And um, so it's always been there. It's hard. I don't know why, but it was. And I had an older brother and sister. I They were a decade older, and it's the mid to late 60s. So groups like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Who, I didn't discover them. I have no memory of discovering them. I just started remembering things and they were there. So they luckily, the mid to late 60s, they had great taste in music, but it wasn't just that this was passively, the music was passively playing in the background. I was actively absorbing things. The, uh, I was an early reader because I love to read as well and write. And as soon as I could read, one of the things I did was look over liner notes and talk and read what every single person did. But it's funny because sometimes because I was young, I got the words wrong. For instance, I remember looking at sort of a, a band breakdown for whatever album at the time. And somebody played guitar, somebody played drums, somebody played keyboards. And I said to my sister, what is this instrument that this person plays? Persecution. And she said, it's percussion. (laughs) Um, So uh, it was things like that. So I had um, those. It's just endemic to me. One of the things I want to, I would like to explore more, because I also like the psychological aspect you bring in. Mm -hmm. And I know that, for instance, I have a real passion for the girl group singles of the early 60s. I have no memory of those singles being on the radio as new, but those records were on the radio as a child. I don't have memory of them, but there's just this connection. And I have a feel that though hearing those songs at that, that time is tucked away deep in my unconscious. And it was there because there's things that really resonate with me from before I have memories, but I don't know why. Hmm. So my interest in music went on for there. Of course, I've seen lots of live shows. I saw my first live show when I was 12 uh, with my older siblings taking me to see Roxy Music in 1975, who then is now are one of my favorite bands. And so for years, I saw a lot of shows. I then got involved in college radio. I was writing. I worked in record stores. So I've known a lot of music people. And uh, eventually, I collected. I've collected a lot of my tickets, and I put them up on these two boards, sort of as a collage, as an ordered collage. And in uh, back in the day, to switch over, and the, these two things merge. 
is of course, when the internet came around, there's that website salon.com. Do you know it? Mm. Yes. yes. Yep, yeah. definitely. Okay. So mm -hmm. I started reading salon early on, on the internet and in the late tooth, and I read it very religiously. And in the late two thousands, they launched this side project called open salon.com open salon.com. And it was amateur writers. First, they curated it, then they opened it up. And I started reading all these people on open salon. And in the early days, it was really interesting. They had a lot of really great writers. And I thought, and I hadn't been writing for a while, I'd sort of been working on this career it wasn't creative. And I thought I want to get back to writing. And I thought this is the avenue. But I thought, what do I want to write about? Because everyone seemed to be it, going it's almost kind of Facebooky. like this is what i'm doing today and i thought no i want to do a project and it was going through my mind so this is around 2009 and one day i was having breakfast i was standing in the kitchen of our old place and i was looking at my concert boards and i went that's it this is my story i am going to tell the story i'm going to tell tell the story of myself as a concert goer but also talk about my life in music and also talk about the concert going experience, because first I wanted to relate these stories. Another thing that had happened is I would meet younger music fans um, and we would talk about stuff and they'd say, oh, you know, I love the Smiths. And I went, well, I saw them twice. And they go, what? Um, and they'd want to hear these stories about these groups they'd missed. And so I thought, OK, I'll write these. But I came up with a framework. I don't like because some of these shows, they're so there's some I remember in great detail. Others, it's more just a feeling or in general. So I decided I would do this. But uh, and I laid out all the shows. There's some compilation episodes where there's not a lot of detail. But I decided if I was going to do an episode, it had to fulfill one of three criteria. One, there either had to be a very strong review component or two, there had to have been something like a story to tell, like something like we were talking about leaving a gig, as you've heard some of the podcasts, just getting to and from gigs as my young self with a lot, a lot of money in a different time, just all sorts of stuff can go wrong. Or there was an element to the gig or the artist or the time that would allow me to riff on an idea or something else. So that's been my guidelines. I started it on Open Salon in June of 2010. And within a few months, I had followers and I was doing really well. Unfortunately, Open Salon shut down in early 2015, taking my audience with it. So I kind of put mylifeinconcert.com on hold and then decided in 2019, I wanted to resurrect it as a podcast. And Unfortunately, I, I was on college radio here in London for many years at Radio Western, CHRW. And, but what I found is, is that, and that was in the 80s, uh, 84 to 92. And I've done a lot of public speaking. I've done a lot of interviews. I love doing all that stuff. But when I sat down to record the first episodes, I found out I'd lost my broadcasting skills. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but you didn't lose your memory because I just feel like your memory is so amazing um, at these shows and just details. And I just wonder how how do you um, tap into that ability to remember? Do you do like any kind of meditation? Do you listen to the music uh, on the album? Like, how do you go back to that moment? Because you just do such a great job of of putting a a story and pictures to that story. And it, I felt like I was there when I was listening to a lot of your podcasts. So I'm just curious, you know, cause I, I, I want to be half as good as you, as far as storytelling. I'm just wondering how do you um, go back to the eighties and really look at what, what you were thinking and what you're seeing, seeing what you're feeling during those shows. Uh, well, before I answer that, I just want to speak to something you said, where you said you felt reading or hearing the podcast you felt you were at the show mm -hmm. a number yep. of people have told me that about that and also the podcast but also the blog and for me that is the greatest compliment you could give me because that is one of the things i set out to do i wanted again i'm not just writing a review of the show i'm writing about the experience and that was one of the things i wanted to pass along that someone could hear this and get a feeling not just the facts 
but the feeling of mm -hmm. being at the show because live events are about feeling more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of answering the question, uh, half of it is an answer you won't like. And it's, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know, each one of us <laughs> as a human being is so different. And we all have our, our pro, pros, our cons, things we're very strong in, things we're not, things we have to work at, things that come easy. And for whatever reason, with this kind of thing, my memory's always been incredible. I, in my family, I'm kind of known as the family memory. Unfortunately, some of my mm. older family members are passing, but it's been a thing through the years where, when did this happen? When did this occur? Ask me, because mm. I would remember. So for some reason, I'm predisposed to remembering this, but also I think it has to do with music. I've had such a lifelong obsession with music um, that I think that's one of the reasons these particular memories are very strong for me. Why they're very strong for me versus other people, I do not have an answer for that question. Because uh, even I wonder that too. Mind you, though, at the same time, if you ask me about a phone number, an address, directions to somewhere where I haven't driven in a while, the name of someone I met five minutes ago, I'll sit there and go, uh, so I have an unusual memory. Um, but the other thing, there's two other things that do help. Uh, you were mentioned going back and maybe listening to the music. One thing I've done is list, especially if there's a bootleg of the show or say with David Bowie's Serious Moonlight tour, I rewatched uh, the Vancouver show and that will trigger memories. Um, oh yeah, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is I have guests on people that I've known through the years who went to shows with me or were there just at the same time. And I love doing those. There's another one coming up. There's actually a whole slew of those coming up. And those are my favorites because it kind of becomes like the movie Rashomon where you have everyone is at the same event, but no one person experiences it the same way, nor do they remember the same details. So when you put people together and blend their memories together, often triggering memories in each other, you get this much more vivid patchwork and recollection of what's happening. So it's part of that. Part of it is just, I don't know why. Anything to do with music, I have a really incredible memory. And I usually map that onto years when records were released. And I use, I use this to remember other things, such as, okay, so what year did I do that? Okay, well, David Bowie just put that album out. So that was January 76. I don't know. <laughs> That's how my mind works. That's all I can say. And there is a lot of research in attaching uh, short-term memory to long-term memory events. There's a lot of research that if you can, if you see a show now and you can somehow a feeling or a note or what someone did on stage, an artist, if you can attach that to something that's stored in that long-term memory, because not everything is stored in our long-term memory. They say that that uh, is there for good, unless mm -hmm. there's a traumatic brain injury, which of course, you know, yeah. could happen well, to anybody at any given time, you know. Yeah, and I but think what you're, go I'll, I'll, I'll go, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. But that's what's happened with me with doing these interviews and with the people I'm interviewing. Mm. Uh, I just did one that's coming up for two UB40 shows uh, that I saw. And it's my, my friend, Phil, uh, who's now in the UK, as well as uh, this lady, Sky Sylvain. She's been a local broadcaster for years, but she was kind of the, the band's contact here brought them to the parties. I mean, all her memories, but the three, and there was a big after party after the 84 show in this house and all of us putting our memories together. Like I would say one thing and they go, Oh yeah, right. And, and then they would do that. So the, I know what you mean about the memories being there because talking to other people can trigger those. I say it kind of is recovered from the mental hard drive. Yeah. And I think what you're, what really inspired us to talk with you is the fact that what you're doing by, you know, tapping into the, uh, the power of or oral history telling, you know, and, and cataloging this, because the further we get away from that era of live, you know, these eras of live music that you're 
uh, you're, you're, you're chronicling the, the less chance people will, will know um, what it was like for fans. You know, I think that experience and um, in one of your podcasts, you mentioned about, you know, how you found your tribe. I think it was in 1980, 1983, 1983. That's right? the gang of four show. Yeah. The gang of four show. Yeah. And you mentioned you're like, I finally found my tribe. Right. And then right. And I think about that and what you're, what you're doing combined with, the other thing that you mentioned about, you know, uh, I think it was different um, people you were talking uh, uh, with who didn't know who these bands were, or what it was like to experience them live. Um, you're you're putting that down and 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 recording that, and that's uh, that that's powerful. And it's it's more important. Well, I don't know. It's important to see the the live show from the you know recording of the artist playing it, but it's a whole other thing, and it adds so much more. I think significance and meaning. When a, when a fan shares, you know, what it meant to them and, and, and like what you're doing is, you know, like this is this is my life in concert. And uh, and that's that's powerful because there's, you know, there's concert experiences that are really important and valuable. I think almost all concert experiences are, are valuable to to remember. Um, but a lot of those are going, you know, unremembered um, and, and they, you know, and they shouldn't. Uh, so that's why I was like, man, look. Look what uh, various artists are here is uh, is doing. It's pretty, pretty remarkable. One because of this, you know, the impact it can have for people. But two, what you know, what Colleen was mentioning about just the sheer ability to remember all of the shows. Because I was like, we have, we've had some conversations about like the, like I can't remember like certain things or I said something and she's like, no, that's not how, that's not how it went, right? Or like, what? Well, yeah, it did. And she's like, no, no. So it's. It's just it's just cool to see what you're doing because it, it it helps to stitch all stitch all that together. But um, you know, there's there needs to be more of what you're doing in that aspect of you know cataloging it so future generations, future fans, um, you know, can can experience these moments that changed you know cha- changed music history, changed live music history. A lot it's of like the a ones, concert historian or genealogist. Yeah, concert concert, concert genealogy. You know, emotional fan genealogy, and we're tapping into all these emotions and. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the attention of what is cataloged is what's happening on stage and mm-hmm. not necessarily what's happening in the hearts and minds of fans. Like, you know, like we're saying before, during, and after the show, which, which is what keeps, you know, keeps people going. And, you know, like we're heading into an era where the live music experience is, is going to be, if not already critical to the live music industry, you know, yeah. with how they're making money and, you know, the, the financial impact of it. And it's just, yeah, it's just so cool for what you're, what you're doing. And uh, it's it's interesting beyond, you know, to say the least. <laughs> well, that was oh, well, thank you very much. Um, and, and definitely that's part of it is uh, capturing <clears throat> that period. It's interesting because I've chatted with a few, especially because I'm here in London, Ontario, and I lived in Ottawa for 20 years. We moved back a few years ago and I've reconnected with a number of people from sort of when I was going to a lot of clubs and that. And especially here in London, it's London is dead center between Toronto and Detroit. And it's two hours either way. It's equidistant. And um, back in the day, I mean, I used to go to Toronto all the time and like Toronto got everything. Everything came through there and all these bands came from there. And I know a lot of people here in London would be like, oh, we don't have this. Like Toronto has this, Toronto has that. Now, when we look back, it's like all these bands came through. We had a completely sustained local scene and not every town gets to have that. So it's incredible also looking back and really valuing the experiences and just the people I got to see who are now gone or the group is no longer together. Even something like the talking heads, they're all alive. I doubt they're going to play together again, but it, it's it, I, it's also getting older and really valuing what happened and wanting to have a record of that and let it be known. The one thing I'll also say about the remembering in terms of going forward with the series is once I hit, it's around 88, I started keeping a journal and I did it through till somewhere between 92 and 95. And that also just happens to be a time when I was seeing a lot of concerts. So once it gets there, it's going to be brilliant because I have notes I actually took. I'm curious, how did you actually journal? 
What's that process look like? Were you just writing facts down? Were you saying it was, oh, it was a the pr- show? Um, oh, I see. Know, details. Well, then or now? Uh, then, then, then. Uh, it was just I started writing a journal. There was just a lot going on in my life. Um, and I think a, a lot of people do that to make sense of things. And so I did that and I wrote it really religiously for years. So it encompasses everything going on in my life. But I was very heavily involved in music at that time. I had a radio show. I wrote for the a local independent paper. I worked at the biggest record store downtown. Like I just had a lot. I was very well connected at that point. And so it's not just about the music, but I have these fat, you know, series of journals where I would go to these shows and then would write details. So the amount of details that are there depend, you know, will vary from show to show, but I have something about any show I would have seen during that time because I would have written about it. Then there's kind of a period where I don't, but I also, when I started doing the blog in 2010, I started writing notes for every show. So every show I've seen from there forward, uh, then on forward, I've got notes. So your journal is um, a mixture of uh, live music experiences and kind of your life at the time. And then they're mixed mixed together because that sounds that sounds super, super interesting. And I'm just curious, like as you looked back, you know, to at those journals, like what did you what did you learn? Like, what did you what were some of your reflections of? You know, I think my first reflection yeah. and looking at a lot of things was what was I thinking uh, when you when you look back on that age and things that were just really, you know, big problems for you because you're still working your life out and some people's lives are more worked out than others. But I think a lot of people when they look back, it's again, what's the thing that um, youth is wasted on the young because now you look back oh why didn't i do this 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 and this and why was i worrying about that and you know um and other things is why wasn't i worrying about this more um so in terms of overall again these are journals i kept about everything going on in my life uh there is that sense of wow naivete um but in terms of the shows it's just um i actually haven't done a lot of in-depth writing for them. I did one for, because I did an episode, sort of a leap ahead episode um, for one of my absolute favorite artists of all time. You may not know her, a woman named Lauren Nero, who is an incredible songwriter. If you go back and research her, she, she didn't have any big hits herself, but everyone else had massive hits with her Fifth Dimension, Barbara Streisand, Blood, Sweat and Tears, and on it goes. Um, And anyway, she came out of retirement and um, I did a podcast. No, 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 sorry. No, I didn't do a podcast about that one. No, it was Keith Richards, sorry. I did do a blog about that one. Keith Richards from 1988. And I dug up the journals for that one. And it's just incredible going through because, oh, I would have remembered 10 percent of this maybe so these episodes that i'm doing where i'm saying all these details this is a fraction of what i could have remembered um so it's quite incredible for that one show uh, keith richards in detroit in 1988 again just going through and it's like yes right oh yeah and i've got like the songs he played like all these little small details that i went home and wrote and it's quite neat because it really brings the experience back to you. And that's something I try to also focus on on the podcast is sometimes these little details are what you remember the most. These little things that happen on the way there, something you saw, something you heard, something somebody said, somebody like just some insane thing that happened. That's what you end up remembering the most is the oddball stuff that sticks out. Also too, What's happening in your life at the time plays a very, very big part. If you're going through a good time, a bad time, uh, you know, um, it really colors how you remember things. Yeah. Was there a, was there a particular show? Um, And and I, I guess also maybe in general, like how did the live music experience help you navigate 
a particular issue. Um, Cause when I was listening to you talk just now, and then also the, you know, how you've talked about on, on your, on your podcast, um, it got me thinking about going through shows, you know, I was you know dealing with stuff with, you know, my dad or, you know, or family or, you know, work or whatever. And I would go to a show and I would have, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it'd be like an ambush of emotion, right? Like, Oh, I didn't know. I like, I was feeling that a certain song triggered something. And then I'm sitting there looking at the stage hearing the music, but I'm also thinking about, you know, um, family and father and, you know, all these different things. And then I, you know, end of the show, I'm like, Oh, okay. I got, there was some cathartic, you know, after, after effect of, of that. And I was like, Oh, I'm glad, you know, thank you. Thank you. M ward for, you know, allowing me to process that, you know, like live. Cause I, I would never have been able to do that if it was just me and with an, you know, at an album at, at home in my, in my bedroom, right. Or, you know, at home listening to that by myself, like it was something about the live show that helped me process that, you know, who I'm with and everybody together. And I was just curious, uh, you know, cause you, you've talked a lot about that in different aspects of, of the live music, you know, helping you do that. Do, do you have any uh, examples of that or like did, how did, how did live music help you process different, you know, different moments and, you know, similar, similar experiences? Um, actually, you know what, one just came to me um, because I mean, what you're talking about, it's kind of that effect of both carth- uh, catharsis and community that you have at the live event. And one for me, I've written about this actually um and it's one of the jump ahead gigs this was a blog entry and it's about seeing patty smith in 1995 and this was her comeback show she'd been in retirement for years i believe in detroit she'd played like as part of a few other shows you know like but she hadn't actually performed as a headliner patty smith since 1979 so this was 1995 and she picked toronto the phoenix in toronto and i remember we were excited we were so thrilled we got take like it sold out in a half an hour and then they added a second show but uh the person i went with we went to the first show and that summer oh man the summer of 95 was a really terrible summer there was just all this stuff going on and i have this weird mix of memories of all of this horrible stuff in my life dotted by this series of incredible concerts i saw from say may through november and it was like pj harvey and that year's Lollapalooza and bjork and sonic youth and then this patty smith show and I don't know if you're Patty Smith fans or how much you know about Patty, but um, she was very important to me because I'd followed what it was happening in the New York punk scene from the beginning. And of course she had been the catalyst for that and became this big star and then sort of walked away with it from her, with her husband, Fred uh, Sonic Smith, who'd been in the MC five and they had children and she took, you know, all this time off. She did dream of life in 88, but then went back to obscurity and in, I think it was 93, her husband, like Fred Sonic Smith and her brother, who she was close to, died within like a very short time span. And clearly she and her husband were extremely close and very much a team. And so this was a year or two later, and this was her first live show. Like There was no merch, no nothing. It was the first set was actually her doing poetry. And then Lenny Kay came out. And they did some songs together. And then later she did another set with the band. And, oh, I know what song it was. She debuted a few new songs at the set. And they came out a year later uh, on her first comeback album, Gone Again. And one of them was a song called About a Boy. And she'd written it partly about her husband, but also about Kurt Cobain, mostly about Kurt Cobain. Um, and about his death and the loss of that. And the band were doing it. It's a very, very intense song. And the song builds and builds. And it was at this moment where the song's at a crescendo and the band's just going really intense. So Patty, at one point in the middle of the song, when everything was at a crescendo and building, 
is she started doing it was almost like an incantation and she was raising her fist to the air go you know going you know life is hard sometimes things don't always work out it really hurts sometimes but so what go on and she was like chanting live live and it's like this is this person who had been dealing with this extreme death and you could see she was almost in tears with just this all this loud music culminating and just this defiant positivity and uh, you know defiance that i we she's going to go on and just seeing her on that stage this small person who'd been through so much and just the power and the positivity and again it was just it was incantatory and it was so inspiring i needed to see and hear that at that moment um it was very very inspiring and again it wasn't like this hey have a nice smile on your face it was the acknowledgement that life can be pain but life can also be a triumph so that's a moment that comes to mind to me that was very special in a concert experience and you're reminding me when i was hearing that story i was thinking when we saw um i saw kanye west at Lollapalooza in Chicago and he's from Chicago. So I remember he it was, he was going through some Samoa stuff because his mom had passed and he pointed to the, the area uh, building that he grew up in, which was South shores. And he said, mama, this is, you know, this is where I started from. And it was like, it wasn't, it wasn't to the audience, right. It was like beyond the audience. It was like to the universe. It was like yelling and, you know, and they had them, he had the mic to do that. So it's kind of mm -hmm. similar to that experience. It was very, it was almost goosebumps. Like you felt like there's something bigger listening in on this experience. Yeah. And it also, it just, it put things into perspective. Um, you go through something like that and suddenly you don't feel quite as alone and you get this feeling of, you know, okay, I can deal with things and um, still went on to be kind of a crappy summer, but that was a really positive event. And it really, it's always stayed with me and it was um, wonderful to hear, to hear and experience that at that moment. Hmm. And are there any um, venues that you can go back and say like, this just made, it was a different feeling of a venue or maybe it wasn't a good feeling. Maybe it was kind of a, a dark feeling or are, are there any venues that you can think of? Um, I can't think of any venues where there's dark feelings, but I can think of some when they're really, some that are really positive. Uh, one is I just actually saw my first big show since the pandemic last September uh, one of my favorite band from the nineties pavement. And I saw them at Massey hall. Have you ever heard of Massey hall in Toronto? No, no, I haven't. Uh, we haven't. Okay. It's one of the most iconic halls in Toronto. It's from the 1890s. Mm, uh, and wow. it just went through a massive renovation. It's just, it's, uh, one of the jewels of the city and it holds about 3000 people. And it was the, uh, Toronto Opera House when it was built in the 1890s. It's still a performing venue. So many classic albums and concerts have happened there. One of my favorite Neil Young albums is Neil. I'm a Neil nut. And Neil Young at Massey Hall is one of my favorite live albums. Also Jazz at Massey Hall uh, with Charlie Parker, and Dizzy Gillespie, a classic uh, live jazz album. Uh, have you ever seen the movie Walk the Line about Johnny Cash? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. One of our favorites. Multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, at the end, yeah. where, okay, he's performing in quote unquote, London, Ontario, where he performs, where he proposes to June Cotter Cash. That's the city I live in. Ah. But okay, that was at the London Gardens. What was the London Gardens? The, it looks nothing like that at all. Where that was shot, that's Massey Hall. Ah. That's Massey Hall. Okay. Oh, and yeah, so wow. it's this hall that has this incredible history. I've seen many, many shows there. Lou Reed, The Stranglers, The Water Boys, all sorts of shows there. Uh, um, just before the pandemic, uh, I saw Courtney Barnett and um, Courtney Barnett and uh, Kurt Vile. So whenever I'm there, it's always a bit of a special experience. I just particularly love that hall, the history that you know has happened there. It's a beautiful hall. The acoustics are amazing. And it also goes up. There's several balconies. So even if you're at the back, 
you're not that far away. So uh, I don't really have a negative feeling with a with a venue. But that's a very positive. Is, one. is there is there a smell to that venue? I always think that <laughs> smell is such an important part of the concert experience. Yeah, yeah, and um, can kind of make I think make or break, or can bring up, you know, if you smell that again when you're out and about, um, you, you you it brings you back to those those memories at that place. Um, do you is there a smell to it? No, I know what you're saying, but no, I, I don't think there is, and that would have been. Again, they just did this huge renovation to the hall. They found these stained glass windows that were part of it 100 years ago that they Mm -hmm. thought lost. They've all been restored. So no, not really a smell. The only thing that comes to mind for me is if I'm in a bar seeing a band and it's that smell of sort of like stale beer and smoke that it's universal. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, yeah, even not so much the smoke now, but back in the day, but stale beer and that. But yeah. I know what you're saying, but I don't think I don't think I can place that for a show myself or a venue. I have a lot of memories with fog machines, smoke machines for some yeah. reason. I don't know. There was a, a group of bands <laughs> that I think I went to in the 90s that I just uh, they just would put that on in the beginning or they would put it on in certain parts of the show. And I just like sometimes I when I once in a while, I'll get that smell, especially around the uh, Halloween people have them like in front of their house. I just rise. You go, I go right back to those shows. <laughs> yeah. Cause it has a very, very distinct scent. And especially mm-hmm. the closer you are to the stage. I always thought if we were going to do like some kind of, you know, group, uh, you know, I don't know, experiment to have a bunch of concert fans uh, get together and, and, you know, have them all have certain uh, smells, you know, and see w- which could go back to their concerts. Right. Cause I have uh I, I have seen Colleen go into that trance um, when we're, you know, trick or treating or, or whatever with with the, with the kids, and I'm like, "Are you okay?" Like, she's like, "Oh, I'm in Green Day '95 right now," you know. <laughs> oh or, wow! And I'm like, "Oh, oh, okay," you know. But I think that's yeah. Smell is the most. Uh, I think one of the strongest senses that is associated with memory, mm-hmm. and uh, you know whether it's you know the smell of uh, pot or you know a smell of uh, or grass if it's an outdoor festival yeah it's just like yeah. i i've I, i've had that before too and it's or dirt there's a lot of festivals yeah. that get really dirty and it rains and then it's like mud and dirt and yeah. you know, a lot of the the what the woodstock is a lot of people will say that they remember just being muddy a muddy field yeah yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because see this is what's really interesting speaking to other people because uh, I'm very focused on those sensory aspects and I know what you mean in other scenarios, but not so much with concerts. So this is really interesting for me to hear that you make those connections. That's really, now you said that, okay, you mentioned a few things, but you said, are there any venues where there's a certain scent? Do you have an example of one, um, Colleen? You know, I can think of, um, there's a club called Shoe Buzz um, in the heart of Chicago. It's uh, what's what you know the area better than I do, but yeah, north, we grew north, up in Chicago, yeah, the north side, yeah. uh, the north side. Yep. Um, and it is uh, there's history to it. It's got a there, there's food there too. So like it's, saloon. It's like a saloon. Yeah. It, it feels like a saloon when you're walking in. And um, it's that wood. Fl- I could smell that wood floor. I swear. Yeah, the smell I the wood floor. Smell the wood buzz. floor. I don't know yeah. if they do some kind of sanding or polish prior to going in, but there's a few shows that I I would if I could teleport myself like every other weekend, I would be there. And it's a <laughs> oh, small wow. dinky bar, but it, it they, it's housed some really um, a lot of um, country America like Americana type stuff, yeah, and yeah. it just it brings back mm-hmm. a lot of good memories there we saw a few friends that were in bands play there maybe that's why i just have a really it it just feels like a soft like home like you're going home like a a home away from home and i think for some venues aren't like that i can think of um man i'm thinking of ah there's a couple of venues i feel like in chicago they're just were dark the sound was bad um, I didn't really particularly like Metro. We did a lot of shows at the, the Metro oh, love, in Chicago. And I know it's a it's I love iconic Metro. venue I love Metro. near Wrigley, the Wrigley um, <laughs> got a different feel to it, different smell, but it's yeah. definitely very, to me, very sanitized and, um, it's just not a soft feeling to it. 
And I don't know, I guess I, I take an environment like that. That's just the way that I'm wired. So I can remember a feeling or an emotion about something, a show I went to that other people, for them, it was just a show and it was just, you know, music and bands and people singing and you know, mosh pitting or, I mean, it, to them, it, it's very concrete, but for me, um, partly probably why I went into the field that I did therapy and was a, a counselor is because there's just an emotional piece that I just carry and take with me, which could be good or bad. And depending on which venue or situation or concert that you find yourself. Well, that's interesting. There's a few things you said there is um, first off, again, it's, I, I hadn't really thought of the scent in that sense but definitely having feelings about venues, regardless of the scent that I get, especially halls I've been to or places I've been to a number of times. But the other thing you mentioned is how it, sort of like these people were at this gig, but for them, it was a gig for you. It went deeper. Again, that speaks to, I think for every, most people like some music, but some people are more deeply into it than others and that kind of um more deeper emotional or effective element that comes from a concert not everyone can feel that i always have this distinct memory in my mind uh, when i was in university and i was studying english but i took some arts courses and i'm a big art fan and it was a we were looking my teacher um was a huge fan of Mondrian. Mondrian was his favorite artist. And he was trying to talk about his passion for Mondrian and these things that he would feel when he looked at these paintings. And finally, somebody put up their hand and it's like, what are you talking about? You keep saying it, but I don't understand what you're talking about. It's a painting, it's colors. And he sort of said, who in this room knows what I'm talking about, uh, just for any kind of art form. It could be music, it could be a book, a film, anything. Who knows what I'm talking about where you see something and it kind of almost takes you out of your body. It's just really hits you. And of course, like, you know, I have the, you know five of those experiences a day um, if I'm with music. And it was incredible that about 60% of the class raised their hands and about 40% of the people sat there. And it's weird. It's like, wow, we are fundamentally so different. You have not had this incredible experience that I have all the time. And it's fascinating, the different types of personality and how different types of personality process events. Again, why I like having mm -hmm. different perspectives on things, because everyone experiences something differently. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Colleen uh, says she didn't like Metro. Uh, I, lo I love Metro because I think it's got a different a different feel to it. You why know, do you like certain... Metro? Why do you like Metro? Uh, because it's it's got uh, it's it, it's dark, and uh, when the show is on, um, you can see the band. It's lit like it's everything's black around except uh, the, at least they we haven't been there uh, in, in a while. But they had the white pillars on the on the side, but it's, I don't know if they do this intentionally, but it's, it's, everything's dark and black uh, around and you could, the music is highlighted. And then when the lights go down, it seems like it just enhances the fact that everybody becomes one in the darkness of right. the crowd. Right. And you're like, it just like enhances this sense of community. Uh, like we're all together. We're all mm -hmm. looking at this and we're all experiencing maybe something collective, but also individual at the same time. So that's unique to Metro because at Shuba's, everything's a little lighter, brighter. You can see the floor. Uh, there's no balcony. There's no, it's very open. There's no it's balcony. It's, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a saloon, like a dance, dance, um, uh, you know, like a, a the yeah. stage is very low. So, you're almost, right. you're almost at the same level as the artist. But it's great. Yeah. You can, you can smell the dust on the floor at, at, at shoe buzz, you, you, you know, your heels feet click along the door, you know, and, and when the music's playing, you can hear people almost tapping their feet like mm -hmm. to the music. So there, but at Metro, everything's a little bit, it's, it's different. Cause it's, it's, you know, there's uh you know, some different acts that might play there, but I, I have experiences of being dark you're folk all focused on the stage, the light, and then you're, you, yeah, you're just kind of brought together in that, in that, you know, that collective shadow 
I guess you would say like that, that is the audience and it just has a different, a different effect with, but, uh, with that, you know, but I like those differences. That's one of the things, um, going to different d venues and different types of shows. Cause I know some people where, Oh, I won't go see a big show. I won't go to a festival. And, and then other people just see big shows. And for me, I feel that all, I mean, I've been to some shows where, you know, they've been small and I love that too, but I sometimes also love the experience of a huge communal show because there's just this feeling, but you can get that in a bar. I guess the part of it is different kinds of shows have different experiential options or opportunities. So I like to go to different kinds of sizes of show types of show because it's kind of like a buffet. Why just keep eating off the same plate? Yes. 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 Yeah. 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 No, it's, yeah, it's interesting to think about all the, yeah. I mean, if you go to a punk show, you know, I've been to different punk shows, you know, or, you know, metal shows or whatever, where there's a mosh pit and there's, there's more sweat, you know, and there's a little bit of a, a stink, you know, everybody's sweating together and you don't get that at, at all shows. Right. And everybody's, there's this athletic activity. So when I go to that show, I've had that experience. And then when I find, you know, when I'm, you know, working out or that I'm, you know, sweating by myself during a run or something like that, I'm like, I, I found myself going back to that show because I could smell, you know, there's a, the smell of sweat, you know, mm -hmm. of my own, <laughs> it's weird. It's a, you know, it just, it just triggers it. So that's, that's just the beauty of live music. Right. And I think everybody has these different, these different memories, you know, that will trigger us um, because of the the sensory uh, or the, or the smell. And that's, that's why we did this. Um, I did this series of experiments um, on the five senses uh, when we first started doing live fix. And I, I took the five senses and um, experimented with them at shows. So I went to, I never went to a Radiohead show before. And my friend was just like talking Radiohead, right? This and that. And, and I loved them. I think they were great. And I'd never seen them live before. So I, I um, asked him what's the greatest experience or why is Radiohead make, you know, what's the big deal about Radiohead live? And he said, Oh, the, the, the combination of the, the music and the, the visual. So I was like, Oh, okay. So I'm like, I'm going to blindfold myself uh, for the first half of the, of the show um, just to see, you know, what, what would happen. So I did that. I had somebody with me that, you know, could kind of guide me, but I was at the show blindfolded and I said, okay, at, at some point, I took the blindfold off. So I removed, you know, the, the major element. And I was like, I was like, Oh yeah, this is, you know, and it had an amazing effect. Cause it was like, it made it made the show even more, you know, compelling. And I did the same thing with um, St. Vincent and, you know, experimenting with um, taste and sound and all these different things. But the five senses I think are, is something that we all collectively have obviously as concert fans. And it just, it, yeah, it's amazing. It triggers, it triggers all these emotions and, you know, it, it, it makes the show what it is with sometimes we don't even, we don't realize it until we reflect, uh, you know, back, back on there, or we're, you know, we smell fog and we're like, Oh, uh, green yeah. day, you know, or you're like, you're like, you're saying, you know, with, uh, the different experiences, the, you know, the smells is interesting, right? Yeah. And it's, and again, it's fascinating because I hadn't thought of it from that perspective. So it's really interesting to hear, you know, your thoughts and your, your, you know, what you've explored in this. So it's quite fascinating, actually. Yeah. We wanted to ask you too, about um, your, uh, your experience. And we, we've been asking a lot of concert fans this, you know, since, uh, you know, COVID put a, put a stop to our concert adventures for a period of time. And I think we all went into a, a series of uh, withdrawal from live music mm -hmm. and on your, on your, po your uh, podcast and blog, uh, you had mentioned, you know, the span of, um, time that you didn't see a show and then your very first show um i believe it was caribou uh yeah yeah uh, going going back but how how was how was covid for you like not being able to go to shows like how did oh i hated it how did you <laughs> um absolutely hated mm. it um and i'm uh and i have an elderly mother and you know uh my spouse and i we we look after her so we had to be really really careful um and we're very you know so um we really had to cut ourselves off from things and i am actually i found the perfect term for me a few years ago i am an ambivert and an ambivert 
is sort of a mixture of an introvert and extrovert. Part of me is very extroverted. Part of me is very, I don't know, introverted, but very thoughtful, uh, very contemplative. And so I like having both. I have to, if I like, literally life is in my face 24 seven, that's too much. But if I'm not, I'm a very social person. And so if that's cut off, it really, really depressing, especially since we had just moved back to my hometown and had really met a lot of new people. So it was very difficult, but part of it was, you know, live music and the, at the depth of COVID where you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where this is going. I mean, we, we have ideas now, but in the midst of it, you don't. And it's like, is this going to go on for years? Am I going to see a show again? And it's interesting because I have, and, and this made me feel good, is that for years, especially now that I'm getting older, I would, I've been very, very conscious when I go to shows to be really appreciative, being able to go to the show, that it's there, that I have the health, that I'm alive to do it. And, you know, especially with my partner who, who likes live shows, but maybe not as much as me. It's like, look, you know what? One day we're not going to be here or we're going to be incapacitated and it's physically impossible. We have to celebrate and, you know, and really understand how special this is because life is so fleeting and health can be fleeting. So I really made a consist considered effort to really appreciate these experiences. So I did take comfort from that in the middle of COVID thinking, okay, I'm glad I appreciated these experiences that I didn't take them for granted. But at the same time, it's like part of your life is gone, especially if, if going to shows on live music is, it's not just something, Hey, you know, I might do that from time to time, but it's an important part of your life. You really feel like part of you's died. So when I went to that caribou show, it was so extraordinary just to be back in that situation. And again, I was at the back. Usually I'm the kind of guy who's right at the front. And, but it was just the music, everyone there, just seeing people enjoying themselves, all of it. It was just, it's a gig I'll never forget. It was a really, really special gig and it was incredible. And I, and again, I've been seeing a lot of local, I've kind of connected with the local scene and there's been this thing here in London, especially centering around the Richmond Tavern, which is one of the oldest places in London. It's been a tavern since the 1850s here in London, Ontario, still operating. And a lot of bands play there. And I've been reconnecting with a lot of people I knew back in sort of the punk and alternative scene from the late 70s and 80s and early 90s. And I just get this feeling that a lot of people, uh, first off, are out doing a lot more things and appreciate things a lot more. And um, I feel that people are putting value on going out and the communal aspects of music and community. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I know we, you talked about some of your, um, a couple of the concerts that you did in the past, but one that I wanted to, to ask you um, that I saw uh, and that you did a podcast on was the police picnic. And I think you went to more multiple, there was there three. Were like two or three. Yeah. There was three consecutive um, years. Can you yeah. talk on those and, and how that experience was? I'm a big police fan too. So it's interesting because I just had coffee with a, an old friend of mine, actually one of the people I've reconnected with. And we were talking about these, but before the police picnic, because the police picnics, they were in, in and around the Toronto area in 81, 82, and 83. But in the summer of 1980 was the biggest one of all, Heat Wave, which was an all-day festival, which is the greatest, the, the talking heads at Heat Wave. That was the first time they'd ever played as an extended band. And it is the first time they played any material from Remain in Light or debuted their new sound. So I got to hear... I was one of the first people in the world who got to hear once in a lifetime, and it was incredible. And Elvis Costello was there that day, Pretenders, B-52s, Rockpile. So the next year, it was different people put it on. The Garys from Toronto put on Police Picnic. Now, the first one um, took place way outside Toronto. Actually, I, it was actually just in this open field in Oakville. And it was, now I know the police had been doing these over in the UK 
and the police, I think this point they'd become huge in the US, but they had been, I think, bigger here in Canada a bit longer. And a lot of those bands from the new wave, they were a lot bigger here than in the US. And so the police, uh, I don't know who put it on, they headlined this all day festival with 10 bands. And the next two actually were dead in the center of Toronto at the old CNE stadium, which is sadly now gone, long gone, because when Sky Dome, Sky Dome opened up, it made the CNE uh, stadium sort of irrelevant. So the first one, uh, it was an amazing day of music, uh, particularly for me, I had wanted to see Iggy Pop for years. I'm a huge Iggy fan. That's the first time I saw him. Um, also, the other huge act was the specials, and that was the number one reason I was going. And well, the specials and Iggy and the specials were brilliant and they broke up a few weeks later. So I got to see one of the last shows of the original band. Wow. Now, as for the police, um, I, it's interesting because I've gone through waves with them because uh, I really liked uh, I remember early 79, I heard Outlandos de Moore and loved that. And then later 79 was Regatta de Blanc, which is still probably my favorite. Um, the two in the middle, Zenyatta Mondad, I'm not too keen on. And um, the thing is, they had, it had been a really long day. There were 10 acts on. There was the Go-Go's who we didn't know they were, this is before they broke. It was like the Go-Go's, Killing Joke were amazing. It was all these bands. And the specials came on, I think, nine or something like that and played like till about 930. The police took forever to come on. Hang on a, sec. <clears throat> a little bit of phlegm. And that can kind of ruin a show if a, an artist takes their time to get on. It's it, oh, it it can, or they it. don't show up. I mean, now nowadays, unfortunately, you hear of artists not showing up or showing up two, three hours late. And, you know, people now with the social media, they can get on, you know, Twitter or Facebook or TikTok and, you know, say, by, you know, I paid the ticket, like, where's the artist, you know, but it can really ruin the vibe of the show. And it, it turns a lot of the fans really, they get really angry and then it changes the vibe. Well, I mean, for us, we had enjoyed the day. You couldn't kill the day because it was so great, but we, we left. I mean, they came on, they played a few numbers and they were so listless. Uh, now, in doing the podcast with my friend Phil, who was here at the time and now lives in the UK, he reminded me, like we were both saying, they were not at their best. They were like boring. They were dragging. And one of the things I'd forgotten was Sting saying his voice was almost gone. And now in retrospect, probably the reason they took so long to come on is trying to wait for the best, like for his voice to recover. But after being out in the sun for that long, and of course, all the sets ran late, like they didn't come on till I think almost midnight. Um, and so we left and that became the very first show I ever walked out on where I walked on a headliner. We left. We were just exhausted, burnt out. They weren't very good. We left. So the next year they had Police Picnic 82. For that one, they moved into downtown Toronto at CNE Stadium. They also slimmed down the bill to six acts. Um, that concert actually, in terms of a concert experience, was, was and is the worst concert experience of my life. Uh, we were sort of a lot more, I was, you know, part of a party crowd and we wanted to take some uppers pills to keep us going. We bought bad pills. We got sick. The sound was bad. We, it was our first big festival. We smuggled in all this booze not realizing that we had seats in the stands. So when we got in, if anyone wanted to use the bathroom, we wouldn't be let back in. So we had to go the day without going to the bathroom, which would be impossible for me at that time. And the people around, it was just all of this bad stuff. At the end of the day, there was um, the talking heads were second last. So I saw the talking heads. Once again, they were brilliant. They'd fix the sound by then. And then the police were great that second year very like totally different between the two shows so there was a big um difference and then police picnic 83 back at cne stadium 
uh, had an amazing lineup, a lot more, a funkier lineup, James Brown, who actually was a disappointment to me. I really wanted to see him. Um, but James Peter Tosh was amazing. King Sunny a day. And I felt that third concert, the police were at their best. And we're talking about a moment in time. It was really incredible because this was a couple of weeks after synchronicity came out and every breath you take had just been this huge hit. And so when I saw them, that was maybe just coming down the charts. Synchronicity was a few weeks old. It was probably, they're probably the biggest band in the planet at that moment. And there was an incredible energy to the show. It's also, I really like synchronicity. That would, the, the first two and the last one are my favorite. And they were on fire. Again, they had been very famous for a number of years, but with that album, they went to a whole other level of fame. And one of my feelings is that one of the best times to see a band is when they've just made some sort of jump in their career. And that could be from, you know, having the bar half full to packing it out, to playing a bigger club, to paying a hall, to playing a festival. When somebody's taken that jump, like when I saw Pearl Jam at Lollapalooza mm -hmm. uh, and they had exploded, they were way down on the bill. Yeah. And by the time the concert went off, they were huge. Mm -hmm. And it's that feeling. And so I feel with that last police show, it was the best of the three. The other thing that happened during their set, this is significant. It's the first show I ever saw. Now this, especially younger people listening to this, if they are, <laughs> they'll go, what? The first show I ever saw at a stadium or a massive show with a jumbotron. Um, so it was like, oh my God, you can see all the details of the stage. Yeah. And at one point they, they took a break and went backstage and had a cup of tea backstage and the cameraman followed in the back. And of course there's 60,000 <laughs> people like just going nuts. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of cheesy now, but at the time it was totally new. And it's like, holy crap, mm. wow. And the fact that you could go see the big show, have the audience, but with the Jumbotron, you got to see some of the details. That was new. And I, that was it was during that police set on that tour that I first experienced that. And of course, that's now a standard part of concerts. So prior to that, you just didn't get to see the little details on stage. No, they were just gesticulating lumps on the stage, and that's all you did. So you sight, right? Mm -hmm. what's that sight uh, uh going back to the five uh the five senses and that in right. that case it was sight you know not necessarily what you were hearing but what you were seeing was yeah, that be... like was like whoa like you know like that was the that was the uh the button that was pushed was the you know what was elevated was now you could see which enhanced what you were hearing and then like you have this yeah like you have this memory now of like uh you know being able to see him take that tea backstage and come back and it was like whoa you know, it's, well it's yeah. interesting because i did a podcast on that and there was three of us all three of us like we told that's again all this great music the band was on fire they were amazing what's the thing that all three of us remembered them going backstage and having a cup of tea <laughs> because yeah, it's absolutely crazy? unique it's singular yeah. so it yeah. stands out in your memory yeah yeah, no, that's awesome. I, I I love that. You know, those those moments. I think that's you know, again, that's why we we, we do this whole show, and and that was why we wanted to talk to you because I see you're you're doing the same thing and cataloging those moments and celebrating celebrating those right. uh, those those moments. And we wanted to ask you because I know we asked you before uh, before the show to to fill out some things, and we wanted to dive in a little bit to those. We've already covered some of the stuff that we've already asked you uh, about, um, mm -hmm. but your your first moment uh live music experience i think you said was roxy music yeah in, in 70 uh, february 8th 75 1975 I, I was 12 12 years old and who are you yeah. there with how, how did that? you get how did you get who there you there with yeah how did you my get older there? my older brother and sister and his then wife and their friends and again like i like by this point i mean most people at the 12 there may be discovering music i'd already been through uh, you know, the end of the beat boom, psychedelia, 
hard rock singer songwriter glam rock and you know it was the mid 70s so i'd already been through several pop culture cycles and also my friend family comes from the uk i was the first one born in canada outside of the country and i was always very i very closely followed what was happening in britain we all did and certainly in the early half of the 70s it was we called it glitter rock then and I liked uh, then as now I like different kinds of music, but that was like it for me, like Bowie, Roxy Music, Mont the Hoople, uh, Susie Quattro, Lou Reed, all of it. And so I had dis I'd known of Roxy Music since 72, but it was with the second album, which I got right at the start of 74, For Your Pleasure, still one of my favorite albums. And again, that was that's that album. Again, these experiences would be very difficult for young people to imagine. But I've had a lot of experiences where like that album, when I heard it, the first time I heard it, it's hard to say that I had an opinion because it was so completely unlike anything I'd ever heard. I couldn't I didn't even have the words to describe how I felt it was so foreign. This happened a lot to me during the post-punk years, which were so experimental, where it seems like every eight weeks, you'd hear some new band that totally changed how you thought about music. So I was like, I just became a huge Roxy fan. I still am. I still listen to all of those albums. And I finally got to see Brian Ferry again in 2016. But it was kind of a thing. It happened at the last minute. Um, because I was staying with my sister and brother-in-law. I was slated to stay at their place downtown and they owned um, the really cool uh, downtown. Um, it was a hair, it was a unisex haircutting shop called Roxy. And it was just, well, how about, would you like to come to the gig with us? And I'm like, are you kidding? Of course. <laughs> um, and it's like, I think back, you know, there's times in my life I've been lucky, times I've been unlucky. Well, I hit the jackpot with that one mm. because it was an amazing show. The band were incredible and it's, it's unforgettable. And the two things I most remember about that, first off, is Brian Ferry's mic was dead for the first two numbers. Uh, they started with Prairie Rose, which was they were touring the Country Life album. And they started with Prairie Rose and the whole band's on stage, except for Ferry. And the song, they're doing all the intro and the, he comes out kind of like a lounge lizard, snapping his fingers, steps up to the mic and nothing, oh, just no. silence. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really incredible. The other thing was uh, I had been wanting to go to shows for years, like the year before two years before, like the New York Dolls came here in 73, and I was like, you know, what, 10? And it's like, oh, I want to go. But I had it in my mind. I don't know why, because you'd see maybe ads for the tours, like they're touring this album. Like, you know, they're promoting this album. For some reason, I had it in my head that the band would come out and play the album, like you, the first track, the second track. And so when I was going to see Roxy, uh, Country Life had just come out here a few weeks earlier and I was had played it to death. I thought, well, I'm going to hear this track. And gee, I wonder if maybe uh, some fluke uh, that they might do, you know, editions of you or something like that. It didn't occur to me that they would come out and do a selection of material and the new album would be part of that. So it was like, mm -hmm. oh, even when they started with Prairie Rose, it's like, oh, well, maybe they don't do the songs in the same order. And then they started doing <laughs> this older material. And it's like, yeah. wow, you know, the wonders of modern science. Wow. So, uh, and during yeah, this awesome. time, do you feel like, explain how your, were your parents very supportive of this? Or was it more your, your siblings that really pushed and encouraged <gasps> the music? Or did they have a big, I mean, were they doing a lot of shows at that point? Were they going to a lot of shows? Oh, um, yeah. I guess, what was the culture like in your family? Was it very encouraged? Or was it um, kind of sneaking to go with your older siblings? No, it was definitely my older siblings, not my parents. And I'm the youngest in the family. So, I mean, my actually, it's funnily enough, I'm interviewing my mother 
uh, this weekend, who's 96 for my podcast, because we went to this cabaret show in England in 77. Oh, great. Uh, but my parents are from that pre-rock generation. Mm -hmm. And my older, like, so when I was, like, I saw Roxy Music, they would have been like 22 and 24. And music was just something that was always in the house. And I also talk about how a lot of my music epiphanies didn't come from the radio necessarily, but because they, even then they were very cutting edge in the late sixties, all the hippie groups. And of course, all the bands coming out of England, but also they had a lot of friends, the friends would bring over records. So I get to hear all their records. And so absolutely. I mean, it was that period, the late sixties, the seventies, all those incredible bands, the records were playing in the home. I knew all of them. I would study the liner notes. You know, I, I remember Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road coming out and we'd play it. And I did this massive poster I wish I could find where of like the album cover and and read all the music press. So, no, they were going to all the shows. They went to all the really cool and interesting shows. And I really wanted to go. So that's where it came from. My parents were from a completely different era, but they're British. And um, I don't know, my, my interpretation is for a lot, I don't know, it's weird, because they weren't into it. But I think it was it was just different times. And it was totally normal for a lot of teenagers to be listening to music going to shows. And I think because a lot so much it was from the UK, somehow, even though they didn't get into it, it made sense. It's interesting, because my parents hated all the rock music from that time maybe a few early Beatles songs, that was it. But it's interesting how music gets recontextualized with time. So when I go to my mother's house, she'll have this station on, and it's oldies, but it kind of goes into the rock era. And I mean, I was there a few weeks ago, and they were playing, and what came on with the Kinks' dedicated follower of fashion. And she was walking around whistling it. It's like, you would have hated it. Back in the day, it would have been, this is a load of bloody noise. But because of the familiarity <laughs> of time, it kind of becomes enmeshed in your world, as it were, sort of of a time. Like, I think my mother, you know, didn't like the Rolling Stones and that. But now it's like, OK, well, I know who Mick Jagger is. So, you know, and I, the songs are familiar, even if I didn't like them. So kind of time works its way into you. And how did your brother get into live music? Like what was uh, he's a musician. I just saw him play live a week ago. Oh, um, he's still oh, playing okay. in a, uh, the low down dirty mojos who just won the Canadian maple blues award. Um, so he was like the first live. actually I'm thinking about it, the first live band I ever saw really saw was his band in the late sixties playing a, a, the new year's Eve party that he had at the house. So this was completely around me. I was surrounded mm -hmm. by it. But I wasn't, again, there's other things that were around me as well. And I wasn't picking up on those. Music always has had a special resonance for me. Again, why? I don't know, but I'm glad it did. And going to live shows, again, it's, I love the records. I love listening to music. That's huge. But going to a show is different. It's more than just the music. You're in this unrepeatable moment in time and also anything could happen even if you're seeing a show that's very choreographed where things happen things don't always go right and that's what you remember so it's the uniqueness mm -hmm. of the experience but also the communal the cart the catharsis and community because shows can be very cathartic but it's this sense of everyone has arrived at this place to see this and there's this kind of especially a really intense moments in the show of kind of bonding. You're talking about the tribal thing in the other episode that happens. And I think that's one of the reasons people go. You mentioned one, uh, one, one thing that I wanted to ask you about too. And it was super interesting, you know, about the, um, the idea of when does the concert ex experience actually start? You mentioned that about, you know, it, you know, it starts when you hear about the concert or when you when wake you, up, <laughs> Uh, you know, when you, you know, fi find out about the artist and you get excited, like, 
Tell, tell me more about that because I think that was really interesting. And it, again, it gets into that that uh, that aspect that we 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 explore here about you know the before, during, and after. And I thought it was it was really interesting uh, hearing you uh, talk about that. Of like, when does the concert experience actually start? Well, I wasn't asking that as a rhetorical question. It was open ended. I mean, I have my own interpretation of mm-hmm. that, but I was putting that out as something to think about. Because for some people who are maybe less engaged about something, it can just be going to the show. But I think if you're very involved in music, especially if you're part of a music community, which happened later where, you know, Iggy Pop will be coming to town and everyone you know is just kind of like five, you know, 10 days to the show. So for me, the concert, again, the whole concert experience can start with just hearing about the show and the, oh, okay. And then buying the ticket and, um, and then the anticipation and thinking about it. And also, unless you're going to the show alone, who are you going with? What are the plans? What are you going to do before? Are you going to hang out before? What might you do after? And I think that, you know, you have the core concert, which is the music playing, but you can't take that out of the context of everything else that's happened because even when you're there experiencing the show that experience is the result of a process that started sometime in the past and it brings it's kind of like sucks in everything all the entrails that have happened starting from hearing about the show till there and it accumulates everything accumulates in this event um so yeah it's it's interesting. And also too, with talking about the gigs, that's something I wanted to emphasize is uh, bringing in all these small details, talking about the before and after, because that really is part of it. I felt, I feel that um, when you read a review for a concert, especially in a newspaper or, you know, that kind of a publication, and I understand, you know, they only have so much space and there's even less of that these days, but it seems almost disembodied. It's almost like the person just beamed in to this space, doing nothing before. They're sort of encased in glass. They don't smell anything. Nothing's going on that just the concert. And then they beam out, which is, of course, not how it happens. There's all these things that happen around it. And I feel that that is part of the experience. And it's an important part of the experience and needs to be talked about and celebrated. Mm question I have is if you had an opportunity to see anyone, any artist past, present, uh, we don't know who's future going to come out and evolve. Right. But past more so past and present, uh, who would you choose to see and why? Well, I'll answer that. Also say, I do have an episode devoted to this 20 acts. I wish I'd seen where I go through the decades and list 20 acts. I would love to get at a time capsule see where, when, why. The one I'm going to pick is the Beatles. Uh, My two favorite band, probably my three favorite artists would be the Beatles, the Velvet Underground and Bowie. Well, I saw Bowie five times. Mm -hmm. I saw Lou Reed three times, John Cale twice. I never saw the Beatles. So it would probably be the Beatles. Um, And I put up on there when I would like to see them it's at this moment that is lost to time and I don't know where it would be, but I would like to have seen them in the UK just as they were breaking. Like I know a lot of people would like to have seen them at, um, at um, the, I can't believe this I'm Beatles, not all my life. And I'm blanking um, the cavern. Um, and I would like that too, but it would have been neat to see them, but they didn't do their own material at the cavern. It would have been neat to have been able to see them when they were playing some of their own material, but they weren't being drowned out yet by the screaming somewhere sort of where there's a buzz about who you're going to see, but you could actually hear the show. And I don't know, that's lost to time that moment. But I also do another podcast about 20, well, I updated it to 22 shows I missed, shows I was supposed to see, I had tickets for. And they didn't, I, for a variety of reasons, and I go through each show why mm-hmm. I didn't go. And out of that 20, the one that's the biggest regret, as it was canceled, was Bob Marley mm-hmm. in um, 1980. And of course, that's when his cancer started spreading and the tour got canceled. 
And I had tickets for him here in London, December, 1980. That's the, like, there's a lot of shows where it got canceled and I couldn't go, but that's the biggest regret. Ah, ah so And close. now did you journal about experiences that you didn't get to see as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, when I was journaling in that period and one of them I talk about and actually have part of the journal uh, and it's, I'm a huge Sonic Youth fan and I saw them many times back in the day. And I've actually met Lee a few times. I've interviewed Kim Gordon and I saw them many times except for when they played, um, oh God, what was the venue in Toronto? And I saw Thurston Moore there a few years ago. Anyway, they were supposed to play the concert hall, which was a venue in Toronto. I saw many bands there. And this was the fall of 1990. And I went with someone and this is I was in university. It was in the fall. I was an English student. All my papers were coming due. I worked at a record store to keep a roof over my head. I had to take a night off to go to this concert. And we get there. It had been moved at the last minute to this new venue. And we get there. It's oversold. So we're oh, wow. waiting, trying to get in. And there's like a huge crowd outside because they've way oversold it. They moved it to a smaller venue. Who knows why? And people were starting to get very, very angry. And th tensions were bubbling over. The cops showed up. They went in. They actually shut the gig down. And there's footage online um, mm. of this in the aftermath. And so I wrote, it's all in there. I've actually got on that blog, it's one of the 20, 22 shows I missed. I've actually got a snippet uh, from my journal. We went all the way in, all in blocked letters. We went all the way there for nothing. It was the worst. <laughs> was like five exclamation points or whatever. So yeah, that was, the, all of that stuff is in there. Also at that point, I was on, I was on CHRW for years and I also wrote the local paper. So I was also interviewing a lot of people and a lot of artists. And so I not only have the interviews from that time, but also writing about it in my journal. So all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. We, yeah, we've been in some situations where we got, uh, I think it was Smashing Pumpkins. I'm thinking of Smashing Pumpkins. I think yeah. Smashing yeah. Pumpkins. Or yeah. uh, postponed. <laughs> postponed, or we're like, no. And I, I, did, I did the same thing. I wrote a blog post about it. And I was like, you got to be kidding. You know, and we interviewed fans that were upset there. And it was a part of, uh, you know, it, we did this emotional experiment uh, live uh, there. And, you know, I, it was same thing so you're you're bringing back some memories there uh, very, Fans were very and, um, they uh, came from all over it was very and yeah. i don't know why they just didn't communicate it too well that it was it's postponed. frustrating well that's really, like X know. i don't know if you know who xtc is they're a british band yeah um yeah, yeah. Uh, a huge xtc fan i they're one of the 22 acts i didn't see and mm -hmm. we didn't it wasn't canceled until the last minute this is the fall of 1980 and this is when Andy Partridge starting ha started having his huge performance anxiety. And literally, they stopped touring after this. But it was such a downer because we'd also been preparing for the show. And I was a teenager. So then I might have had to go home in a highly altered state and have a conversation with my parents. Um, <laughs> but that was such a drag getting there. It's like, what do you mean it's canceled? <laughs> We've been looking forward to this for so long. And I never saw them again. They never toured. That was it. I feel like we need to get every concert fan together and have this, you know, this like uh, session of we can all, you know, uh, have the this trauma of something being canceled. Trauma session, or... you know, and just uh, get that all out together. I think we all have these like experiences, you know, to uh, just process. Uh, like but that's you, it. You know? Seeing show, seeing shows also <laughs> means not seeing shows. That's part of it. Mm. Yes. Yes. Well said. Well said. Yeah, it, it has been fantastic talking to you, uh, uh, various artists, and and uh, it's just just so great to be able to um, hear your stories again. We we've uh, just had had a uh, had a ball, a great a great uh, a great time. I feel like we could we could keep talking here for so much longer and uh but um man is, is Maybe there to have you on again for part two absolutely if uh, i'd be open to it i'd be open to it if you're up to it I, this has really been a pleasure because both of you i can tell from your podcast but also speaking with you is your big music fans and live music fans 
So it's incredible to be able to talk about this stuff, but also hear about some of your perspectives and things that you focus on. So I have enjoyed this immensely. I think there's a smell I will always associate with our conversation with you. I don't know what that is yet, but there's always a St. Saint Patrick's Day. I think I will always I think the smell would with. be beer. I think that would be it's it's St. Patrick's Day. An beer, Irish I think would an Irish saloon somewhere or something, maybe. Well, you for got those it. of you. For those of you that with that's a, when we're with a leprechaun like, for right. sure now everybody oh, knows what, what day we re recorded i guess right yeah oh, leprechauns, yes. leprechauns. Right. and uh yes yeah no it's been been fantastic thank you thank you so much for uh for joining us and we're uh we hope to have you have you back sounds like you're open for an encore uh uh just like a good a good artist should do right so. excellent thank you so much i've really enjoyed this it, it's been a great experience thank you so much for asking me Thank, thank and you. everyone listen to mylifeinconcert.com. There's a plug. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Mylifeinconcert.com. Actually, go go check it out. Uh, we're huge fans. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again. Live Fix Podcast is a production of Live Fix Media and is produced by Chris and Colleen Catania. Hey, we know every concert fan has a live music story to share, and we'd love to share yours in a future episode. So head on over to livefixpodcast.com and click on share your story. We look forward to hearing from you. Like what you heard? Did you get inspired by the stories of your fellow concert fans? Then help support Live Fix Podcast by subscribing and sharing a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We appreciate your support and thanks for listening. <laughs>